Hey there, is today your first time here? Or your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope that you'll see that we're welcoming and spiritually passionate and getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. So, we'd like to welcome you to Life Christian Church. Good morning, Life Christian Church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. I hope you're all well this morning. Before we get started this morning, I have a special video that I want to share with you. So we are going to play that right now. A traveling preacher, a homeless outcast, called crazy and possessed. This is Jesus. Another hopeless rebel, mocked and beaten, hung on a cross to die. This is Jesus. Another lifeless body, stuffed into a borrowed tomb, soon to be forgotten. Is this really Jesus? Wake up. Wake up, O oh sleeper, and rise from the dead. This is Jesus, sent by the Father to be crushed for the sins of the world. This is Jesus, declaring to all he would be killed and then raised to life on the third day. This is Jesus, healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead. This is Jesus, a missing body from an empty tomb on a Sunday morning. This is Jesus, the image of invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the Lamb of God, the light of the world. This is Jesus. Savior, Lord, King, Alpha, Omega, Creator, Redeemer, Friend to Sinners, Hope of Nations, the Messiah. This is Jesus, the resurrection and the life for all who trust in Him. Wake up, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. This is Jesus. Stand with us, everybody. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Death has lost its victory, and the grave has been denied. Jesus lives forever. He's alive. is alive death has lost its victory and the grave has been denied jesus lives forever he's alive he's alive he's the alpha and omega the first and last is he the curse of sin is broken we have Perfect liberty, Lamb of God has risen. He's alive, He's alive. Hallelujah! Jesus is alive. Death has lost its victory, and the grave has been denied. Jesus lives forever. is he the curse 
of sin is broken, we have perfect liberty. The Lamb of God is risen. is alive. Death has picked its victory and the grave has been denied. Jesus lives forever. He's alive. He's alive. He's the Alpha and Omega. The first and last is He. The curse of sin is broken. We have perfect liberty. The Lamb of God is risen. He's alive. He's alive. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. Amen. They told me y'all like that song. And Jesus is alive. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Let's sing about God's amazing grace. This is unfailing love 
that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me So let me, re- let me read you something um, that's, that's very special about this day. We celebrate Christ's resurrection and, and conquering death. This is from 1 Peter chapter 1, and it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. That's how much God loves you that he sent his only son to die, only to raise him from the dead three days later on this very special Easter Sunday. And all who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If we just believe and have faith and trust that God is who he says he is, that he did what he said he would do, and that he continues to work in and through our lives by placing our trust in Jesus, the King of Kings. Amen, church. Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change This one thing remains Your love never fails, it never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up and Never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up never runs out on me and on and on and on and on it goes for it overwhelms and satisfies my soul and I never ever have to be afraid one thing remains one thing remains your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up never runs out on me your love in death in life i'm confident and covered by the power of your great love my death is paid there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Oh, your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me.
me Your love never fails, it never gives up It never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up It never runs out on me Your love And on and on and on and on it goes And I never ever have to be afraid There's one thing remains One thing remains Your love never fails, it never gives up never runs out on me sing a church your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up and never runs out on me your love oh your love and death in life i'm confident and covered by that can separate my heart from your great love oh. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, now I surrender. can move the mountains my god 
God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He's my Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. We're singing for the glory of the risen King, Jesus. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Just our voices. Shine your light and let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King, Jesus. Shine your light and let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Oh, he's my savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king jesus shine your light let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king shine your light and let the whole world see come on church sing it out for the glory of the risen king jesus shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen king jesus shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning, church? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and, and we just, we thank you. We thank you for this gift of salvation that comes to us because you chose us and you sent a piece of yourself down here to earth in the form of Jesus. He lived among us. He taught us how to love you and how to love others. And he made the ultimate sacrifice by turning his life over and becoming sin, our sin. He bore the sin of the world on his shoulders. And the Bible says he became sin who knew no sin 
so that we might become the righteousness of God. And we thank you for that today, God. It didn't end there. And we saw this morning and we sang about this this morning. Jesus is alive. And because he lives, we have new life. We have eternal life. We have salvation. And we get to claim ourselves children of God. So this morning, I pray that every ear will be opened, every eye will see, every heart and mind will understand this message of salvation, this free gift that comes through belief and faith and trust because of your grace and your mercy. On this Easter Sunday, God, we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Okay, before you sit down this morning, go find a friend, neighbor, or loved one and share God's love with somebody. Good morning, Life Christian Church. Christ is risen. Amen. What a beautiful morning to be gathered together in fellowship and worship. I am Pastor Taylor. I'm the youth and young adults pastor here at Life Christian Church. I'm just going to go over some uh, upcoming events and announcements with you. So if you have your bulletin, go ahead and pull those out. Let's look at those together. April 2nd. So today, actually, our baptisms were canceled because of the rain. So we're going to be looking to reschedule those. Maybe next week, the following week, we'll uh, let you guys know when that will be. Uh, We'll still use the inflatable heated baptistry pool that we have available. 
This coming Tuesday, April 2nd, is our Potluck and Bible Study, which meets at Stanton Central Park, led by our very own Pastor Shane. So if you please uh, show up, please bring a dish to share. April 19th, we're doing a laser tag event with the youth group, which is super exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Canamars. Uh, so if uh, you want to attend, please reach out to me. I have the details, cost. Please bring some friends. It's going to be a great time of fun and fellowship together. April 20th is the Friends of Family Food and Diaper Distribution at Stanton Park. We need volunteers for that, so please come and show up and help us. If you know someone that needs food or diapers, please send them our way. And then May 4th, there's the traditional family values. They invite you to put your feet to your faith. Let's join us for a March for Tradition Values from 10 to noon. And the meeting place, the address is listed there. Same if you want more contact information, there's an email address to reach out to. Now, if you're new with us this morning, we do have a Connect card as well. We ask that you would fill this out and please place it in the giving baskets after service. We would love to connect with you, get to know you, and serve you. Now, this is for the church body, those of you who attend here regularly. I want to share a devotional giving thought with you this morning. And one that really applies to this morning is from the resurrection. And uh, when you look at the life and actions of Joseph of Arimathea, right, this minor character, or even Nicodemus, um, it can encourage us to view our, pos our possessions in light of our faith. So in John 19, uh, Joseph goes and gets permission from Pilate to retrieve the body of Christ. And Nicodemus then shows up with 75 pounds of myrrh and olives and spices, and they cleaned the body of Christ, and then they bound him uh, in these spices and these cloth linens, and then they placed Jesus in a tomb that was owned and recently purchased by Joseph. Nicodemus generously gave out of his own possessions to anoint the body of Christ and to clean it. And Joseph gave up of his tombs and wrapped Jesus in cloth. These men did not know the resurrection had happened yet. It hadn't happened yet. And the care and intentionality they had for the body of Christ, how they gave generously out of their hearts for Jesus. Joseph's appearance is brief, right? But it's remarkable in how he gave to our Lord Christ. And so I think that is a great example for us this morning, those of us who attend here regularly at Life Christian Church, to remember the work of Christ and that every good gift is from above, that he gave us generously in his death and resurrection, eternal life. And these men gave generously out of their riches. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for this uh, beautiful Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we just thank you so much that we can come together and fellowship and worship you and the great work, the greatest work, the greatest miracle, the greatest discovery of all mankind. Lord, I pray that you would anoint our pastor this morning, speak powerfully through him, deliver the word to our ears. Let us hear your words, God. We thank you and bless you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the K through 5 and 6th grade is going to stay here this morning. There's no Adventure Bible Church. Um, but if you're a teenager, let's go ahead and follow me across the street for a message from your very own Pastor Taylor. Thank you. So the early church had a tradition. The person up in front would say, he is risen, and the church would respond, he's risen, he's risen indeed. So let's try that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You guys have just all proclaimed the truth. Isn't that wonderful? It has been said that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is either the biggest hoax ever foisted upon mankind 
or the most amazing fact in human history. Today we ponder the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did it really happen? God says yes, and God made a declaration in Romans 1.4. He kind of drew a line in the sand and said, I'm just throwing this down right now. Who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord? So God declared something. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The proof of that is he was raised from the dead. Now, that event happened 2,000 years ago, but it can still have a profound effect upon our lives right now. Some of you know our friend and elder here, John Robertson, had a near-death experience two weeks ago. Uh, he had an adverse reaction to an epidural injection, and his uh, blood pressure went down to 56 over 47. His pulse went down to 38 beats a minute. And the paramedics were called. They were shaking him. Stay with us. Stay with us, John. John felt like his life was slipping away. But John declared, I, have no, I had no fear of death. Now, why was that? Because he had a living hope. 1 Peter 1.3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So John had a living hope because he'd been born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now I want to tell you about a 20-year-old that had a similar experience. Let me picture this 20-year-old right there. <laughs> that is yours truly at age 20. I just turned 70, so you want to know what 50 years can do to you? Look right here, okay? So that 20-year-old had a fear of dying. I was petrified that I was going to die and go into eternal darkness. I had no hope. I was foolish, rebellious, clueless, empty, lonely, before I got born again, just shortly thereafter that picture was taken. And God gave me a brand new life. He gave me new hope, new meaning, a new purpose, new life within, a new love, joy, and peace, which the Holy Spirit comes into when the Holy Spirit came into my life. So really, there's good news for our Hindu and Buddhist friends who anticipate being born again after they die, reincarnated. They need to know that you can be born again in the here and now, in this life, and it's not in your afterlife that you're born again. In fact, being born again is not really an option. It's a mandate for anybody that wants to go to heaven. Jesus Christ said in John 3, 3, that marvel not that I say to you, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. So the only way we're going to heaven is if we get born again, and we're born again, according to 1 Peter 1, 3, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I know John's testimony is true about his near-death experience. I know my testimony is true, but that is not enough to persuade everyone that Christ arose from the dead, right? So I want to give you some persuasions today that he indeed did rise from the dead. Your sermon outline is in your bulletin. The alliteration letter today is the letter E, so see if you can guess some of them. And the first one is eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses. Now, there are four types of evidence, if you're on a jury, that can be presented to persuade you. There's video evidence, there is circumstantial evidence, there's DNA evidence, and there's also eyewitness testimony. Multiple eyewitness testimonies have been sufficient enough to put a lot of people in prison for life because you have more than one person that says, you know what? I saw that guy right there commit this crime. Multiple eyewitness testimony is powerful. And that's how I look at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew was an apostle. He was an eyewitness. Mark actually got his gospel from the apostle Peter. Luke, it says in the introduction to his gospel, that he wrote from eyewitness testimonies. And of course, John, the apostle, also an eyewitness. So in John... Um, the Apostle Thomas also was an eyewitness and a skeptic of this whole thing. And he says in John 20, 25, 
They were saying to him, namely Thomas, We've seen the Lord, but he said, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into his, the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples again inside, and Thomas was with them. You see, he wasn't there the week before when Jesus showed up. A lot of things can happen when you don't show up for church, right? And the doors, having been shut, stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. He said to Thomas, Reach here your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it to my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, namely to Christ, My Lord... And my God. If you've ever wondered if Jesus Christ is really God, Thomas the Apostle just said, you're my Lord and my God. And the next verse, Jesus blessed him. Jesus said, because you've seen me as Lord and God resurrected, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. That's that's all of us. We didn't see the risen Lord. But if you're a skeptic on all this, there was a skeptic 2,000 years ago that was standing in your place saying, you know, I'm not going to believe unless I see it. And he was an eyewitness testimony of what he saw, the nails and the uh, wound in his side. So on another occasion, resurrection appearance, the apostles were in the upper room. This is in Luke 24. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. Some of your Bibles might say ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it before them. So obviously this was not a hallucination. This was not a ghost. I mean, I don't think ghosts can eat a piece of fish, can they? You cannot hallucinate somebody eating a piece of fish. So I think they were totally convinced by all this. You know, a lot of people say, why why isn't there more proof that Jesus arose from the dead? Well, in Acts 1-3, to these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. You see that? Many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So for 40 days, he made 15 different resurrection appearances, sometimes to a single person, sometimes to two, sometimes to seven, so on and so forth. In 1 Corinthians 5, 5, uh, 15, 6, after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. So the audience is being told, you know, one time it was 500 people and they're still alive. Like, like look them up I mean, because they saw the risen Christ. So to me, the four Gospels are compelling, multiple eyewitness testimonies. When I read the Gospels, it does not sound like someone just made that up. That sounds real and true to me. So a second persuasion, not only eyewitnesses, is examples. You know that Jesus was not the first or the only person raised from the dead in the Bible? You know that? You know that in the Old Testament there was precedent. Both Elijah and Elisha prostrated themselves over a dead young man and raised the young men to life. So those two prophets raised someone from the dead. And Jesus himself raised three people from the dead besides himself. In Mark 5, it was Jairus' daughter. While he was speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble a teacher anymore? Take the child by the hand. He said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were all completely astounded, blown away. And then there's also the funeral that Christ encountered uh, in Luke 7. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin. And the bearers came to a halt, 
And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up, began to speak. This is dead man talking now. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. I love this story. Christ just stopped the funeral, said, you know what? We're going to end this funeral right now. You know, get up out of that coffin. Truly amazing. Uh, and his good friend Lazarus, he raised from the dead. Uh, that is in uh, John 11. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench. If you have the King James Version of the Bible, it says, he stinketh. He stinketh. For he has been dead for four days. So this guy was going to be smelling really bad by now. When he heard these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. A man who had died came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what the things that Jesus had done. So even though they saw a guy that had been dead for four days, raised from the dead, uh, if you have a hard heart, even a resurrection from the dead is not really going to convince you, right? And so these people uh, were not convinced because they had a hardness of heart. So the third persuasion today on your outline Easy for God. A resurrection from the dead is really easy for God. Acts 26, 8. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise from the dead? You see, a more basic question is, did the resurrection really happen? Is, does God really exist? Because if we believe in an all-powerful God who created this world just by the spoken word of his mouth, then raising somebody from the dead is not all that hard for him. A couple more verses on that, Jeremiah 32. I'm sorry, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. So even this king that was told, why is it considered incredible? He actually believed in the prophets. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Now that's called a rhetorical question with an implied answer. So the answer is no, nothing is too difficult. If he's the God of all flesh, he can do anything. Luke 1, 37, even to the Virgin Mary, who is going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. For nothing will be impossible with God. With God, nothing is impossible. Raising someone from the dead is not impossible for God. Having a virgin conceive is not impossible for God. <clears throat> Having an 80-year-old lady or 70-year-old, 70 75-year-old lady, Sarah, to conceive and have a baby is not impossible for God. And there's a verse in Samuel 2.6 that um, you might want to take note of this. The Lord kills and makes alive. So the Lord can drop anybody on the spot if he wants to. Ananias and Sapphira, right, just dropped them on the spot. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol, which is the grave, and raises up. So God can send someone to the grave. God can also raise that person up because he's God. Romans 4, 17, we looked at this last week. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made of you. In the presence of him who, whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead. You get that? God can give life to the dead. If we don't think God can do that, then we have a too small of an image of God. God gives life to the dead. Well, a fourth persuasion for you this morning is that the resurrection of Christ is etched in prophecy. It's etched in prophecy. Now there's one verse in Psalm 16 that is very compelling. This is written by King David, all right? For you would not abandon my soul to Sheol, which means the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. So who is he talking about? Who is the Holy One? Is David talking about himself? Is David a Holy One? David committed adultery. David committed murder. We don't think he is the Holy One. He's talking about somebody else. And the New Testament interprets who that Holy One is. In Acts 2.29, Peter is preaching. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn to him with an oath 
to seat one of his descendants on his throne. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades or Sheol, the grave. Hades means the unseen realm. Christ was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his flesh suffer decay. So Christ is the fulfillment of Psalm 1610. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And if you're wondering how could 3,000 Jewish people believe and come to Christ on one day, in the book of Acts chapter 2, is because Psalm 1610 has been staring at them for over a thousand years that God would not allow the Holy One to be abandoned to the grave, nor suffer any de decay, which is exactly what happened to Christ. Christ was not abandoned to the grave, and his flesh did not suffer decay. So it was a fulfillment of a very powerful prophecy. And what is kind of undersold is that Jesus Christ himself also prophesied his own resurrection. Many times over, John 2, for example, the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. He said, destroy this temple on three days. I will raise it up. So Christ is saying, I'm going to resurrect myself, if you read that passage carefully. The Gospel of Matthew alone, Jesus Christ prophesies six times that he's going to rise from the dead. So Matthew 12, 39, not in your outline, but it's in your Bible. He answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And in Matthew 16, 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up, on the third day. Matthew 17, 9. They were coming down from the mountain. Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has been risen from the dead. And Matthew 17, 22. While they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. He will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. Again in Matthew 20. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. And one last one in Matthew 26. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Now, if someone in our world was going around saying, I'm going to die, and then three days later, I'm going to come back from the dead, I'm going to be raised from the dead, we would watch him very closely, wouldn't we? And then, if it didn't happen, we would put him in the loony bin, wouldn't we? This guy's off his rocker. But Christ went on record many times over saying, yeah, they're going to kill me, but you know what? On the third day, I'm rising up again. Jesus Christ is a prophet more than a prophet, he prophesied his own death, burial, and resurrection. And then one more a persuasion, number five in your outline, I think. The resurrection explains the unexplainable. There are certain phenomena that occurred that first Easter that can only be explained by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For example, James was the half-brother of Jesus. And in John 7, 5, it says not even his brothers were believing in him. Now, I had a couple of older brothers that kind of acted like God, told me what to do all the time. But James' older brother actually was God, but he wasn't even believing in him. He was a total skeptic. Um, now, in Mark 3, he came home. This is Jesus coming home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. His own people, and that means his own family, Heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he's lost his senses. He just flipped his gourd. You know, he's out of his mind. I think 
I think Jesus' brothers had bought into that this guy is off his rocker. Yet, in Acts 1, the brothers are standing in with the church in the upper room at the day of Pentecost. Now, what could have persuaded James, who didn't believe in his brother, to uh, become a Christian? Well, let me show you. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, I don't know if you've noticed this before, but Christ appeared to James and then to all the apostles. He appeared to his brother James because James was a big skeptic, right? Little, little brother not believing in me. So he shows up and says, hey, you know, how's it going? Right? So um, there's only one way to explain really why James turned from skeptic, not believing in Jesus, to believing in Jesus. And that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He saw Christ arisen from the dead. Well, how about Saul of Tarsus, the enemy of the church? Now, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went up to the high priest. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This is what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. So Saul of Tarsus was saying, I vote that we kill the Christians. So definitely the enemy of the church, what happened to him? Well, in Acts 9, on the road to Damascus, as I was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So it does say in 1 Corinthians 9.1, the Apostle Paul says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? So how do you explain a man who is so hostile to the church that he's voting to put them to death, now is the greatest evangelist and church planter for the church, wrote 13 books of the Bible? How do we explain that incredible turnaround? Only one thing, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It totally turned him around. And also the Jewish converts... You know, the early church was like 10,000 Jewish people. These were Jewish people that believed in Yahweh, have no other God but Yahweh, the temple sacrifices to sacrifice for your sins. Uh, they were resistant to any kind of false teachers and false prophets. So why did 10,000 of them convert to Christ? You know, on the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place. Jews living in Jerusalem, you see, the Jews would migrate to Jerusalem on the feast days. So Pentecost was one of these feast days. So Jerusalem was overcrowded with all these Jewish people, thousands of them. And then, of course, Peter, um, this Jesus God raised up again, which we are all witnesses. So the 10,000 new converts are talking to the apostles who were witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's only one way to explain the early church. Jewish people converting out of Judaism to Christianity, and that is they were persuaded by witnesses of the uh, resurrection of Christ. So we have one more thing to have to explain. What about the actual body of Jesus Christ? If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then what happened to his body? Do you know that the tomb was not empty? Do you know that? The tomb was not empty. Let me show you in John 20, verse 5. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. So the tomb was not empty. The grave clothes were right there. And a couple verses later, and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by himself. Now, if someone is going to rob a grave, would they take the time to roll up the face covering you know, and put it away? I don't think so. That makes no logical sense whatsoever. So the grave clothes were in the tomb. So like something happened to the body, right? We drop down the next verse. Also, there were angels in that tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and do not know where they have laid him. You see... Everybody knew that Jesus Christ had prophesied that he was going to rise from the dead on the third day. It was really not a secret. 
So we see in Matthew 27. Now the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver, speaking of Christ, said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, He is risen from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard, which means four Roman soldiers, by the way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the grave secure. Along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. So a seal on this massive, it's a round disc, like 300 pounds. They put like a Roman document that says, if you touch the seal, uh, this rock belongs to the Roman Empire. If you touch this rock, you're going to die. So that was the seal on the grave. They made it as secure as possible. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. I don't know if it really grabbed me before. The angel is actually sitting on the stone that was rolled away, this large disc stone rolled away from the grave. And the angel is sitting on it, maybe with his arms folded kind of like this. I don't know. Maybe. And his appearance was like lightning, as clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. They're petrified. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. Now, while they're on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. I think that's called a bribe, right? And he said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him while we were asleep. Now, there's two big problems with this cover-up story. First of all, Roman soldiers, if you fall asleep on duty, you can be executed. So that's not likely. And also... They said the body was stolen while we were asleep, so they didn't, they didn't wake up during this massive earthquake. They didn't wake up as this 300-pound stone is being rolled down. They didn't wake up for that. Also, how do you know what happens when you're asleep? I mean, I don't know what happened last night when I was asleep for those seven hours or whatever. I mean, I'm clueless. I mean, it could have been like, you know, the night at the museum or whatever, you know, crazy things happening in my house, I wouldn't know. So this whole cover-up story is just ludicrous. It doesn't even make any sense whatsoever. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed, and this story was widely spread among the Jews as it is to this day. A total cover-up of what really happened to the body of Christ. Now, next verse. I just want to say something. Does it make any logical sense that the Christians stole Christ's body? Just bear in mind that 10 of the 12 apostles died a martyr's death, right? They died for their faith. Now, there are some people that might die for what they think is true, But how many people would die for a hoax, for what they knew was a lie? That 10 of these 12 apostles went to their death for a lie that they had stolen the body, that Christ was was alive from the dead? One of them would crack, right? They couldn't take that all the way, not all 10 of them uh, to their grave like that. So it makes no logical sense that the church stole the body. And certainly the Romans would have stolen the body. Because when it's crisis proclaimed as a rival king, the Romans would just whip out the body of Christ and say, really? Here he is, cold dead. So the last persuasion I have for you is eternal life. I love this verse, Ecclesiastes 3.11. He made everything appropriate in his time. He also set eternity in their heart. You got that, you guys? God put eternity in our heart. 
The reason we long for and crave and hope to live forever, because God put that capacity in our heart, our longing for eternity. He said it right there, so we would want it, we would crave it. I mean, many world religions want to have eternal life too, but God is the one that put that craving for eternal life right into our heart. And here's how to have eternal life. The Bible makes it really plain. First of all, letter A is believe. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's the resurrection, you will be saved. That is a promise. If you believe in the resurrection of Christ from the dead, you will be saved. And you believe it enough to actually say it out loud. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. So believing, of course, is necessary. In John 6, 47, Christ made it pretty simple. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. You believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose again from the dead. You have eternal life on the basis of your belief and the basis of your faith. And believing is equated with receiving Christ. Let me show you this in John 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. See, the last part of that verse says believe in his name. The first part of that verse says you've got to receive him. So we have to receive Christ into our life, into our heart, That's what true belief is all about. Many of you, no doubt, have already believed in Christ. And there's another thing here. It's called repentance. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should what? Repent. Repent is a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. It's a moral 180. It's a U-turn in life. And he says, we are, have to repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by what? Raising him from the dead. And then once we believe and repent, final step. Oh, Christ said on one occasion, unless you repent, you're all going to likewise perish. Repentance is necessary for salvation. Jesus Christ said it. Unless you repent, you're going to perish. Uh, And that means uh, many things to many people. That means when you're living in the darkness, you turn away from the darkness. If you're practicing a sin, you turn away from that sin. You renounce it. You walk away. You're done with the life. Uh, It's called the dominion of Satan. You turn from Satan to God. That's what repentance is all about. And then baptism is the last step. Christmas, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And that's the pattern in the book of Acts. If you believe, you get baptized. And Christ commanded it in Matthew 28. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So baptism isn't just like a choice or an option. It is a command as Christ who had all authority in heaven and on earth. So I just want you to see if you've done the ABC already. Have you believed in Christ and his resurrection? Have you repented and turned from your sins and renounced them? Have you been water baptized? And so this would be a perfect Sunday if you haven't checked all three boxes to get on board with God's plan instead of your plan. So let me have a word of prayer. Lord in heaven, thank you that um, you caused me to be born again through the resurrection of Christ. And God, so many people I know have had a similar experience, a born again experience only possible because of the resurrection of Christ. Lord, if anybody here needs to cross that line today and jump on board with you, then say these words silently as I say them aloud for you. God, today, I am persuaded that you rose from the dead. I believe, Jesus, you are the Son of God. I believe you're Lord of all. 
And I want to uh, turn from my old ways, turn from the darkness, turn from my sin. I want to repent and to return right to you. And I want to uh, follow up on Christian baptism as well. So Jesus, come into my heart today. I want to receive you into my heart as my personal Lord and Savior, as John 1.12 says. As many as received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. I want to become a child of God today. Come into my heart today, Lord Jesus. Amen. So we always have a song of response here at this church. Do things a little bit different here today. So today, of course, if you made a decision for Christ or a commitment to be baptized, I want you to come forward to one of these two tables. And there are some connect cards. You can fill out your name, contact information, check the box of what you're deciding. Like, I want to give my life to Christ or I just gave my life to Christ. I want to be baptized. Also, if you're a first time guest with us, I'm going to give you a book today. It's called More Than a Carpenter. It's by uh, Josh and Sean McDowell, Father, Son. Josh McDowell, who wrote this, was a skeptic himself. He didn't believe in Christ. But this is a book of evidence that Jesus is who he said he was, that Christianity is true. I want to put this in your hand. So during the response song, just come up to the table and grab one of these books. It's a gift that I would try and track you down and find you after church, but I may not be able to find everybody. So make it easier on me. Just come up to the table, grab a book. I got a track on uh, the gospel. This blue track is called Eight Minutes That Can Change Your Life. I got a track on baptism too. It explains everything. We'll answer all of your questions about baptism. Come up and take that baptism track. And of course, if you just want some prayer, we'll be up here to you, for you as well. So let's all be standing. And Ken is going to lead us in a response song. Again, if you're a first-time guest, you haven't been here before, or maybe you haven't been here in a long time, come on down and just take my free gift. Would you? It's a, it's a symbol that Christ's free gift of salvation is also on the table. Or a commitment for baptism, or you just received Christ, let us know. Sign a Connect card. I hear the Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness, watch and pray Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow.
worship shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up. of kings, the Lord of lords. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. So we're coming to time to take the Lord's Supper or communion. Uh, we offer these on the front table, but if you did get one when you came in and you want to take communion, uh, then raise your hand and keep it raised until we get a communion cup in your hand so you can participate what we call the Lord's Supper. I do want to say that from this point on that the tables up front are still open. If you want to get your free gift of the book or sign a commitment card or if you want to get one of these tracks, feel free anytime during the communion just to come forward and come up to the table. Sometimes people secretly make a decision and then they get a little nervous. I don't know if I should go forward or not. The Bible says, don't be ashamed of Christ. That it's okay to come up, make a commitment. It's going to be, there's a promise in 1 Peter, whoever becomes a Christian will not be disappointed. You're not going to be disappointed or ashamed in giving your life to Christ. But you might be ashamed if you wait too long. So I'm going to show you kind of an obscure verse that, uh, that ties the resurrection into the cross and forgiveness of sins. It's in Romans 4, 25. It says, He who was delivered up because of our transgressions and was raised for our justification. You know what justification is? It means just as if I'd never sinned. It means you've been declared not guilty of sins. You are innocent. And it says he was raised for our justification. It's the only verse I know that ties the resurrection into our forgiveness of our sins. A rather amazing verse. So let's go to God in prayer for a moment. God, thank you that you have taken our sins and cast them into the depths of the sea, as it says in Micah chapter 7. 
You removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Lord, thank you that um, you've forgiven them. You sent them away through the blood shed on the cross. Thank you for the resurrection, kind of the stamp of approval that our sins indeed have been uh, declared not guilty. May we examine our hearts this day, this Easter Sunday of all days. God, we want to confess if we have strayed, drifted away from you, we want to come back to you right now with our whole heart. We want to walk with you with everything we've got, love you with everything we've got, and we want to get back on track with you. God, forgive us for our wanderings. In Jesus' name, amen. So three days before his crucifixion, he was at the Last Supper. And he took some bread, which is in the bottom of your cup, and he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. After the bread, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me.